Hi there everyone and welcome back to Higher Biology. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to complete Unit 1, DNA in the Genome, and we're going to be going through Key Area 8, Genomic Sequencing. So, first of all, you should remember from our previous Key Area that the genome is all of the hereditary genetic information within an organism. What we can now do, though, is find what the genome of an organism is and even what certain genes are composed of in order to further study them. So this process is known as genomic sequencing. So for example, back in 2003, the Human Genome Project managed to sequence the entire human genome. If you think of your genome almost as the instruction manual to yourself, it contains all the genetic information that makes you you. It means that we're now able to figure out what certain genes are located on chromosomes, what mutations cause which conditions, and so on, so we can further study these. We've moved forward with this as well by sequencing the genome of other organisms, and we're going to have a quick look at three main uses for this. First of all, and a fairly topical use at the moment, is using genomics for an accurate diagnosis. If we sequence the genome of a disease-causing organism, say for example a virus, that it means that we can diagnose that condition pretty quickly, and we also know a bit more about how that organism develop, develops and operates. Uh, we can even use this, as we are at the moment, with tracking the spread of these viruses and what mutations are taking place by comparing their genomic sequences. A second use for genomic sequencing is creating specific pesticides. You may remember from National 5 that pesticides are used to kill any organisms that are destroying your crops but rather than just wiping out all the insects in a field, for example, you can use the genome of that pest species in order to create a pesticide that would only affect that species and nothing else. The third use of genomic sequencing is the use of model organisms for research. A model organism is a species which has been widely studied and is easy to breed and maintain in a laboratory setting. If we know the entire genome of a model, of a model organism, then we can study the effect of, say, different mutations on its genome. We can do this instead of using mammals, and this reduces both the cost of research and it also removes a lot of the ethical concerns that come with research. So, for example, here, one of the common model organisms you come across is the fruit fly and the Drosophila. They only live for one day. You can breed them very quickly. You can do a lot of genetic tests on them without harming, say, a mouse, and this takes away some of the ethical issues. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how we can compare the genomes of different species. So if you were to write out the entire genome of any species, you would spend weeks writing out lines of C's, G's, A's and T's. Instead of this, we rely heavily on the use of computer and statistical analysis in order to compare genomes, to highlight the number of differences between the genomes and also to identify sequences that are similar, such as shared genes between different organisms. This process of using computers and statistics is known as bioinformatics, and it's becoming a hugely important area of biology. So just to bring in another key word that you need to know, when we compare genomes, we talk quite a lot about the term conserved. So what this means is that if the DNA sequence data between two different organisms is very similar, we would say that the DNA sequence is highly conserved. So for example, if you compare the human genome with a chimpanzee genome, you can see that they're very similar, so therefore the DNA sequences are highly conserved. If you share a large number of DNA sequences, and therefore you're highly conserved, then you're also closely related from a genetic view. Conversely, if you barely share any DNA sequences at all, then you're very distantly genetically related. This idea of evolutionary relatedness is what we're going to be focusing on for the next part of this key area. So in order to compare how closely related different species are, we use genomic sequence data and we compare it to create something called a phylogenetic tree, as you can see here. These phylogenetic trees are a way of visualising how closely related different species are and also when species diverged into new species. One of the key things to remember in this visualisation is that from the bottom of the tree, time increases towards the modern day at the top of the tree. So the top of the tree is the most recent, and the bottom of the tree is the most ancient. Just to bring in another couple of terms here, at the bottom of a phylogenetic tree, you will have a shared common ancestor. And there will be a point in time where a new species, which we will call a lineage, has evolved from that shared common ancestor. You can see this as a split in the tree. The more biological term instead of split, though, 
is known as divergence. So when these new lineages split from the shared common ancestor, this is the point of divergence into new species. To give you an example of this, this phylogenetic tree shows four points of divergence. You could be asked at which point in the phylogenetic tree was there a shared common ancestor of certain species. So for example here, the first divergence took place at point one, where there was a shared common ancestor of species A, B, C, D and E. From then on, you can see other points where new lineages diverged from other shared common ancestors. Again, remember time is moving forward to modern times at the top, so in this example you can see the most recent divergence was at point four, because it's closest to the top. If you were asked in the exam at uh, which point was the shared common ancestor of species C and E, for example, you would trace back both lineages until they met at point two. Make sure you have a look over these and practice tracing those lineages back to their common ancestors. So one last point you need to know, in order to actually construct a phylogenetic tree, uh, we've already discussed that you need the DNA sequence data to compare. However, in order to put some sort of date of divergence, we use fossil records to estimate time. What we're going to be taking a look at in a moment, however, is a more modern approach which is now being used to calculate times of divergence. So as bioinformatics and phylogenetics are being used more and more, we've been able to use comparative genomics in order to classify all organisms into three domains of life. Uh, the bacteria, which are prokaryotic organisms, the archaea, which are prokaryotic organisms, and finally the eukaryotes, which unsurprisingly are eukaryotic. Uh, we don't need to go into any more details about these or these classifications at this stage, but this is something that you need to know. And again, if you're looking at this tree here, you can see the initial point of divergence where bacteria uh, broke away, and then further on, there was a more recent divergence between the archaea and the eukaryotes. So we spoke previously about the use of phylogenetics to construct phylogenetic trees. Molecular clocks are a method of dating that are more commonly used now and they're seen as more precise. This method is based on the knowledge that the number of nucleotide substitutions found in the genome is proportional to time, and so it carries on at a constant rate. What this means is that you can find out the number of differences in a certain gene between two organisms and calculate how long ago they diverged. This means we can now use the mutation rate of a gene along with DNA sequence data and also the fossil records to create a more reliable estimate of sequence divergence. So one example of a molecular clock that is used is the mutation rate for the gene that codes for alpha globin, which is a component of hemoglobin. This is known to have a mutation rate of 0.56 changes per billion years. So if we assume this mutation rate is constant, we can then compare that gene between different organisms to work out the differences and then use the number of differences between them to calculate the time of divergence. The problem with this approach though is that molecular clocks, as I've said, assume a constant rate of mutation. If these mutation rates actually vary over time, then you don't have an accurate calculation and this can also greatly affect your estimated time of divergence, possibly affecting it by billions of years or millions of years. The final part of this key area focuses on how we can use information in our own genome in order to directly benefit our health. Uh, you'll likely have seen adverts on the TV to companies which will sequence your DNA and they can predict your chances of developing a certain condition, or if you carry a gene which is more likely to lead to a certain type of cancer uh, later in life, for example. This is an area of biology uh, called pharmacogenetics, and it involves the use of your genetic information in treatment, as some people may react well to a certain treatment, while the same treatment might have little impact on others. The part we focus on is this personalised approach to medicine is called personalised medicine. Uh, it's a fairly self-explanatory term, but it means that your genome can be sequenced, and it then can be used to select the right type and the right dosage of drugs in order to treat you personally, rather than a blanket approach to giving everyone the same treatment and seeing how they react to it. Finally, this personal use of genomic sequencing is seen as a bit controversial. Some people think it's great and that you can screen your own DNA to see if you're going to develop some sort of medical condition at some point, or if you potentially have a family condition that runs through your genes, and hopefully if you know that, you'll be able to treat it as soon as possible. 
Other people don't like the idea of your genetic information, which in some ways is the most personal form of information you have, potentially being used by others. What about in the future if everyone started using this and employers demanded to see your personal genomics uh, and they couldn't hire you or wouldn't hire you because you're at risk of developing a certain illness? This is a big cause of debate and it's one of the things you should really think of is if you were going to have a serious medical condition later in life, would you rather know or would you rather not know? And that's it for Kiria 8 and for Unit 1 of Hire. As always, folks, thank you so much for listening. I also really appreciate all your comments. Uh, I'm sorry this video has taken a while, but we'll continue on with Unit 2 of Hire, and I'll speak to you again really soon with Kiria Area 1 of Unit 2, uh, Metabolic Pathways. So thanks so much for listening.